How many Christians, when they're looking for a local church, they're looking at that church's polity and how they are structured in church government? Church government will affect your life. Church government affects the life of the church. Amen? Deeply affect the life of the church. And the life of the church will affect your life if you're a Christian. So, for example, the church in St. Crea is sending Phoebe to bring a letter to the church in Rome. That's an association of churches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read about a partnership of the churches in Macedonia to help other churches. And think about much of the Reformation was an effort to bring the church back to this truth that Christ is the head of the church. Because the Roman Catholic Church will declare, they declare that Christ is the head of the church. But in practice, in the real life, who is the head of the church? The Pope. And let me tell you, the state, the government, is not over the church either. Sadly, especially during the COVID, we saw how many churches believe that Caesar is over the church. Please open your Bibles to Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians. We're going to read a few verses in chapter 1, then chapter 4, and then chapter 5. So in chapter 1, and I want to invite you to stand if you can. So first, Ephesians chapter 1. Let's read verses 22 and 23. It says, And he put all things under his, referring to Christ, feet, and gave him as, what? Head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now let's jump to chapter 4. Verse 15 and 16. So instead of being tossed around by all sorts of false teachings and being a baby, Paul says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with, with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in Love. And now chapter 5. We could entitle the book or the letter of the Ephesians as the headship of Christ over the church. So Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22 and 23 and 24. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. You may be seated and let's ask once again the Lord's blessing and help. We, we are needy children and we need you. Father, to feed us. We pray that you'd help me to be a faithful slave, help me to be faithful to your word, and help this lovely congregation, this lovely church to be faithful, discerning, so we cry out for your help. We all need help here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. His name, Jean Morelli. Not many of you, I doubt, know who he is. He is one of the earliest proponents of congregationalism. He wrote a book, the French title, Tracté de la Discipline et Police Christienne. And it's literally a book, a treatise on Christian discipline and polity. 
And that was in 1562. So you think about Luther. We celebrate the Reformation. What day we say the, was the Reformation? October 31st, what year? 1517. So, let's close. <laughs> so, you see how close this guy is to Luther and the whole Reformation. He wrote this book in 1562. This book was divided, it is, you can read today, it's divided into four parts. And the first part of the book deals with the church discipline. And Morelli, he argued that the local church had been vested with the authority of Christ to perform church discipline. He's arguing that because you think about where he is, the context is that in some churches, the state is the one performing church discipline, and in other churches is an outside body that's performing church discipline. And he's arguing that no, actually, the local church has the authority to do that. And he says in part one, that the, the congregationalism is not anarchy, because that's what people were saying. Oh, if you have congregationalism, then you have anarchy. So he said that congregationalism is not anarchy or modern democracy. And he says because there is a body of law, and that's the scriptures. That's why there is no an anarchy, because we have the rule of the king through his law, his scriptures. And it's not a modern democracy because there is a body of administration with pastors or elders to lead the church. That was his argument in part one. Part two of the book, Jean Morelli argued that the congregation's power was to receive and excommunicate members. That belongs to the church, not the state or not a different body outside the church. It's not the state that has the power to tell who should be a member in the church or who should leave the church. Part three, he covers the congregation's authority to choose their own leaders. Sadly, his book was condemned by the Synod of French Reformed Churches. Who is the most well-known French reformer? Yes, Calvin. It's interesting well, I'll get there, but just so, so you think about the Synod of French Reformed Churches. And they declared the book to contain wicked doctrine. So he was asked to recant. You need to recant of this book. And in Luther's style, he said, Show me by scripture. Prove me by scripture that I'm wrong. So he ended up, he ended up being condemned as schismatic. What is schismatic? Divisions, one who is bringing division, and he was excommunicated. Now imagine if he's your father or your grandfather, and you ask why grandpa was excommunicated from the church. Because he believed what we believe. Morelli said the authority belonged to the local church. He handed a copy of his book to his friend John Calvin. Haken says apparently Calvin didn't have the time to read. And the reason was that John Calvin refused to enter into this, the, discuss, the discussion and the arguments lest he undermined the sin of the decision. So sadly Calvin did not step up or didn't say anything but remove himself. But Theodore de Beza, if you guys know about the reformers, you know that Theodore de Beza, he was one of Calvin's right hands. Always is John Calvin. Theodore de Beza, he was very active in condemning Gian Morelli. He read the book, and as Calvin's right hand, he was one of the main opponents of Morelli. And Beza and Bullinger, both French reformers there, they saw Jean Morelli and they call him a dreadful Anabaptist. Do you remember the Anabaptist? Jean Morelli, he had to flee France right after the massacre of St. Bartholomew, and he went to England. 
So Michael Haken, a church historian, he says that there is work to be done to find out if Morelli's idea of congregationalism affected the Puritans. Because you remember the First Baptists are coming from the Puritans and the idea of separation and, and some of the Puritans with the idea of autonomy of local church. So you think about so many Christians who have been persecuted. So many Christians died during the Reformation because of their understanding of church government. So much of the Reformation was actually a, a protest against the government of the church in relation to the Roman Catholic Church. And you contrast with today, for many Christians, the subject of church government is not important at all. How many Christians, when they're looking for a local church, they're looking at that church's polity and how they are structured in church government? And here's why it's important. The question of church government is, in the final analysis, a question of where authority resides within the church and who is to exercise it. And... Church government will affect your life. Church government affects the ch life of the church. Amen? Deeply affect the life of the church. And the life of the church will affect your life if you're a Christian. Some of us here have been part of bigger churches where the ministry was fully accomplished by paid staff. So some of us have been to churches where all the ministry was by paid staff. And church becomes just this event once a week where you go and just a cool thing, maybe a social thing, or for other people it's just like a seminary class. Those who attend these churches have very little to no involvement at all with church's major decision. And how much involvement the members have in the life of the church and how much involvement the leadership has in the church will affect the church and the lives of their members. So sadly, some of you have been to churches most of your life where you had no involvement at all with the life of the church. Major decisions that took place. And that affects your Christian life. Besides that, church government is Christ's way to protect the gospel and his church. Therefore, we must pay very careful attention to this subject. And that's where we start embarking. So today, next Sunday, and probably the following Sunday, we're going to be covering the subject of church government. Here's the two aspects that I want to cover today. The head of the local church. And that's Christ Jesus. And then you're going to look at the independence of the local church under Christ's headship. So, as we move to the first part, the question is, who is in charge of the church? Who is in charge of the church? There is, we could say that there is a very short, straightforward, simple, basic answer. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. He is the good shepherd. It's His will that we are seeking. We pray for His will to be done. Peter says that Jesus is the chief pastor, 1 Peter 5.4. Paul says, that's a beautiful statement in Ephesians 2, verses 18 through 21. Paul says, For through Him, Christ, we have access in one Spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, and listen to that, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being what? The cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the corner, the, this cornerstone is the foundation stone. I have heard people saying that the cornerstone is the capstone. No. The cornerstone is the foundation stone. And you know that because, first of all, Paul is quoting Isaiah. And uh, Isaiah 28, 16 is referring to the cornerstone, the foundation. And we know that because the church is being built. It's not done yet. A capstone is put when the church is done. 
He's the foundation stone. He's the cornerstone where the other things are added upon. Clint Arnold, he says, Paul is here referring to the cornerstone, the most significant part of the foundation of the temple. He says, this large stone bore much of the weight of the building and tied the walls firmly together. In the early 90s, archaeologists discovered five enormous stones that helped form the foundation of the Jerusalem temple. The largest stone measured 55 feet long, 11 feet high, 14 feet wide, and is estimated to weigh 570 tons. Christ is the cornerstone. The main piece that provides direction and shape and structure to the rest of the building. Paul says the apostles and the prophets, they come as the foundation on top of that cornerstone. And now the Christians are added as bricks and dwell with the Holy Spirit, making this building beautiful. So Greg Allison has, says, from this metaphor of Paul here, the government of the church is implied. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And its initial human founders are the apostles and the prophets. So, Jesus Christ alone is the head, the king, the shepherd, the ruler, the elder, and the Lord of the church. We love solus Christus, Christ alone. And that applies to the life of the church. Christ alone is the head and king of the church. That's something we need to keep in mind. So, we read earlier. All these verses, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, and he put all things under his feet, Christ, and gave him as head over all things. Or Ephesians chapter 4, talks about speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, the head of the church. Ephesians 5, he's the head of the church. The headship and lordship of Christ means that he is the one with divine authority to command, instruct, and guide the church. And think about much of the Reformation was an effort to bring the church back to this truth that Christ is the head of the church. Because the Roman Catholic Church will declare, they declare that Christ is the head of the church. But in practice, in the real life, who is the head of the church? The Pope. So there was this strive during the Reformation to bring back, no, the true head of the church is Jesus Christ. And Jesus' headship and government are ex executed primarily by the word of Christ. Think about that. How does Jesus manifest his rule and kingship and headship over the church? Through his word. Through our submission to his word. I like what Sam Amari says. He says, let me go back. In the scripture, we find the words of the king, Jesus, governing the church. He tells us the mission of the church. He tells us how we should relate to one another. He tells us how to keep the church holy. He tells us who should do the preaching and teaching. He tells us the content of the, content of the preaching and the teaching. Jesus sets the rules. He orders our life together. His scripture is the voice of the king governing his subjects and ordering his people according to his commands. And that's something that the early Baptists, 16th century, were fighting for to bring this truth back that Jesus Christ is the head of each local church. Each local church has Jesus alone as the head and sovereign ruler. And Jesus exercised his authority in the local church through his word. And his word gives the qualifications for leadership. And the leadership leads the church in preaching and teaching and helping the church to exercise her Christ-given authority in certain specific areas. So brothers and sisters, who is the head? Who is in charge of the church? Jesus Christ. That's the most basic, that's the most fundamental answer that we have. And we must embrace that. It's so tempting for us to say that, but then live in a different way. Pastors who suddenly start thinking that they are the head of the church. 
They think that they are the king and the ruler of the church. There are churches where there are one pastor or a group of pastors, or in some churches, a board of deacons. They start thinking that they are the, the head of the church. They start, they start looking at their own interests and applying that to the life of the church. The leadership of the church is a leadership of slaves. We are under shepherds. That's how pastors are. So it's very important for leadership, pastors, elders, to know the head of the church is Jesus Christ. He bled for her. He died for her. He sought her. He instituted her. Amen? I love this local church, but it's not mine. It's not mine. And on the other hand, there are members and whole congregations who see themselves as the head of the church. There are congregations that start pursuing their own agenda and interest instead of Christ's interest. Sometimes we see individual families or individual members or a small group of members in the church, we start thinking that they are the head and lord of the church. A lot of times it's because of all the time they have been in church. I have been in this church for 40 years. I have given my whole life to this church. Or the money they have put in the church, and suddenly they start thinking that the church is theirs. They can lord over the church. The church does not belong to any of us. The church is Christ's. And those who forget that the church belongs to Christ will have a painful wake-up call when the head and husband shows up. Therefore, before creating divisions and problems in the church because you're not getting what you want, you better check what the head of the church wants. And he reveals that in his covenantal document given to us the scriptures so the headship of Christ who is in charge? Christ Jesus that's the most basic fundamental main answer now let's move to a second aspect and that's connected okay? all Christians agree that Jesus is the head and king of the church amen? all orthodox Christians are going to agree with that but how this truth is applied into church government will be very different depending on the denomination. So you think about Christ is the head, but how does he manifest his headship, his rule over the church will be different in different denominations. I think with the exception of the Quakers and the Plymouth Brethren, who deny all sorts of church structure and formality and leadership, right? Especially the Quakers, you have, and the Plymouth Brethren too, it's more a spirit led church. Uh, besides that, historically, there have been four major forms of church government. The first one, it is the Episcopalian, the Anglican type of church government, where you have the Episcopos, the bishop who is the ultimate authority. Uh, and here you have Anglican, Methodist. Methodist, we think about the Methodist with the Wesleys. The Wesley is coming from the Church of England. He's coming from the Anglican Church, and he brings that same type of government into the Methodist denomination. You have also some Pentecostal churches, right? You have bishops in some Pentecostal churches, and they try to apply the same type of Episcopalian government to their church. Uh, the problems with this type of government are manifold. Uh, I think the first one is the difference that they make between a bishop and an elder or a pastor. Uh, in the scriptures, the bishop, the elder, the pastor, they are always used for the same office. Besides that, this type of government is very similar to the Roman Catholic type of government. The bishop is a successor of the apostles. And here's the problem. They, they say, they argue that that's the best system to protect the church from false teachings. Go ask the Anglican church in Africa if they agree with that. Because 
when you have the archbishop and the fellowship of Episcopal churches accepting the ordination of women and homosexuals into ministry, suddenly that must be applied to all the churches. So now that's what we have in Africa, this, the African Anglican church refusing to accept what's coming from the head. So that's the Episcopalian type of government. We have also the Presbyterian type of government, and it is much better than the Episcopalian, for sure. Uh, the local church ends up being under the authority of a group of elders. And I think although the Presbyterian type of government departed from the Episcopal and the Anglican type, it still fails in giving the congregation the authority and autonomy that the New Testament shows that the local church possesses. So you have the church, and the churches are kind of free, but then you have a general assembly, you have the synod, so you have all these structures where the local church is ultimately an accountability to this whole system. That's why they send pastors, they change the, what they call the teaching elder. You have ruling elder, teaching elder, and they, the top there is the one who is sending the pastor, not the church choosing uh, I don't have here, but another type of church government is the independent, the independent churches. Uh, the hard thing with the independent, you have such a vast variety of independent churches. So some independent churches, they are structured at the Episcopalian, so you go to this church, it's just a local church, they believe they're independent of all the others, but the church itself, the local church, is structured just like an Episcopal church. You have the bishop on top, then you have another group of people, uh, others are Presbyterian. You have independent churches where their elder rule, so the elders rule the church, and the church has no, the congregation has no voice whatsoever. Uh, and I would say that a lot of Baptist churches today sadly fall into this type of church here. And the, the last one is the congregational, and that's where we stand as the congregational type of government. Uh, and the local church is autonomous, self-governing. You don't have, besides Jesus Christ, you don't have another group outside the church that tells the church what to do. Uh, here you have most of the Baptist churches, and you have the American Lutheran churches. It's interesting, the American Lutherans, they're congregationalists. Not the German Lutheran, but the American Lutherans, they are congregationalists. And I have a word of caution towards the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches. That's basically a liberal association of churches. So we're, and that's what I plan on developing through these next two, three sermons, is what it means to be a congregational church. What it means to be a pastor, elder-led congregationalism. But before that, I want to cover, especially the, this aspect, the, the co how congregationalism is connected with church autonomy. So the headship of Christ over each local church and the authority that He, Christ, gives to each local church help us understand the biblical and the Baptist principle of church independence or church autonomy. We're going to be using these two words. You see, all Christians will agree that Jesus is the head. And the king of the church. But this truth has tremendous implication for the church polity. Because it's the fact that Christ alone is the ultimate king, head, and elder of each local church. That helps us understand the biblical truth that each local church is ultimately accountable to Christ alone. Not to any human leader, group of leaders, or denomination outside the local church. Amen. So let's define that. What does it mean for a congregation, especially congregationalism, to be independent? Haken writes, Local church autonomy is the idea that every church is free to determine its own agenda apart from any external ecclesiastical coercion or force. Baptists believe autonomy reflects the biblical pattern. As Stan Norman notes, the Bible makes no reference to any entity exerting authority above or beyond the local church. So he says, positively stated, churches have the freedom to follow the Lord's leading. 
in their worship and witness. Or put more negatively, no denomination or convention or association can force a church to do something they does not wish to do. Think about that. We saw last Lord's Day how the church is composed by regenerated members, believers, men and women empowered by the Holy Spirit. And to these congregations, Christ gives the authority to make legal, jurisdictional claims on His behalf. So that's very important. Each local church full of men and women, born of the Spirit, to these people Christ has given authority to make decisions, authoritative decisions on His behalf. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul says, Therefore we are ambassadors of Christ. Ambassadors of Christ. Think about in the ancient times, the kings, they would send ambassadors. And what did, and who were the ambassadors? Representatives of the king. They carry the authority of the king in the areas that they're being sent to. Just as a king would do for an ambassador, Jesus gave the church the right to speak with his authority. So think about that, looking at the local churches as embassies of the kingdom of heaven. Who here has ever been to an American embassy outside the U.S.? Good. So you know that you go there and it's basically a little America. It doesn't matter where you are, in the Middle East, Africa, South America, you go there and you have a little America. Borders, right? Not anyone who can enter that place. And you go to the embassy, so for example, when we were in Brazil, we would go to the U.S. Embassy in Sao Paulo. And you go there and they have the authority to stamp your visa, to give you a new passport, or within, in our case, to give a birth certificate for the kids. So, that's important to think because... And the same thing now when we need to go to the Brazilian embassy in San Francisco for the passports or visas. You, you see that they have this authority to give these things. But they don't make anybody American. They have an authority to declare in light of what we have here. It's evident. So here we have the authority to give you a passport or birth certificate. And the same with the church. Each, lo each local church has Christ given authority to give or better recognize new birth through, through baptism and the renew of the passport through the Lord's Supper. Each local church has the authority to make decisions about the who and what of the gospel. We don't make Christians and the church doesn't make anyone pastor. We recognize what the Lord is doing. Amen? And he gives each local church the authority to do that. If the church is composed by men and women who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, who know the Lord, who hunger to glorify His name, then we can rest that these decisions will be done for the glory of God. So, the fact that each, the fact that each local church has authority to make jurisdictional and legal decisions on behalf of the kingdom of God leads us to believe, together with the overall teaching of the New Testament, that each local church is supposed to be independent, autonomous, self-governing. We don't need a body over us deciding what needs to take place in this church. Amen? Herman Bavikin, ba oh, it's beautiful what he says. I love that. He says, Christ equips and nourishes them, the churches, as the vine sustains the branches. He says, while every local church is a manifestation of the universal church, of the people of God, at the place where it manifests itself in action, each church possesses its own fullness and, it, and is independent. There are, no, there are no mother churches, including Jerusalem and Rome, in the sense that one church might be free to lord it over other churches. He says, all churches 
are equal because they are all, even if one has been planted by, the, by another, dependent in the same way that is directly and absolutely on Christ and bound to His Word. For this reason, the Reformed also abolished the diocese and the parish st structures where local churches are linked to and controlled by the cathedral church and its bishop. In Scripture, every church is independent, completely equal in rights to all other churches. Think about when Jesus, in the book of Revelation, He's addressing the seven churches. He's not sending that letter to a group outside the church. He's not saying to an archbishop or to a presbytery outside the church. He sends to the angel, and we can, there will be discussion, is the angel a heavenly being? Is that an earthly messenger? Is that one of the pastors of the church? It doesn't matter because the message is directed to the whole church. The one who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to whom? The churches. He's talking to the churches. The letters of the New Testament are predominantly addressed to individual local churches. Even Philippians, it's amazing. You open Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, slave of Jesus Christ. And it says, to the episcopos, the bishops, deacons, and all the saints who are in Christ in Philippi. He addresses the whole church. Leadership, congregation. In Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus gives the keys to the whole church. So in Matthew 18, the case of church discipline, the final court of authority is the local church. He says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the ecclesia, the assembly. And if he, if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Who is the final court of authority? The church. Not one pastor, not a group of elders, not a board of deacons. The church. The church is the final authority here. And sadly, I know of Baptist churches, one in particular, where you'd expect to be a congregational church. And I was talking to this pastor about, okay, when you guys have a case of church discipline, excommunication, how do you do that? He said, we just talk to the deacons. And I told him, I said, but Paul and Jesus, they talk to the whole church. Oh, but we see the deacons as representing the whole church. Like, but that's not in the Bible. You're creating that. You're forcing that. Oh, well, that's how it has always been. A Baptist church. Paul, he follows the teaching of Christ. And he says, when you all are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, he's talking to the whole church. When you're assembled as a church, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are the whole church. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Who is to expel the man from the church? The whole church. And Paul will say later in Second Corinthians about the voting of the majority. To the Galatians, it's fascinating, you open in Galatians 1, and Paul is talking to the whole church. I'm amazed that you are already deceived. How foolish of you, old church in Galatia. You guys need to do something. The whole church has the authority to expel the false teachers and welcome true teachers. It's the duty of the congregation. Well, there is no hierarchy over the local church by an outside group. And let me tell you, the state, the government, is not over the church either. Sadly, especially during the COVID, we saw how many churches believe that Caesar is over the church. The state is not over the church. 
That's one of the main battles that the First Baptists were fighting in England. No, the king of England is not over the church. The state has no power to decide who the members are, the leaders are, to excommunicate people from the church. And that's one of the problems with theonomy, where suddenly the state is telling even churches what to do. Local church autonomy is the concept that every local church is free to determine its own agenda apart from any external ecclesiastical coercion. So, Stan Norm, he says, autonomy means that each local church is self-governing. Each congregation makes its own decisions regarding all facets of, facets of church life. A local congregation may freely choose to seek counsel from other churches and denominational officials, but the membership is not required or, or bound to follow the advice. The decision of a local church do not require the decisions of a local church do not requ require outside ratification or approval. I believe the congregational type of government allows each local church to write her own statement of faith. That's what we did. We wrote our statement of faith. And, and that's sad because I know a lot of Reformed Baptists who believe that you must hold to the 1689. And suddenly you are creating a law as if you need to be bound by this document that does not belong to our local church as a binding authority. No. I love the 1689. have high respect. I'm always quoting. I, I read often. But it's not infallible. I believe there are errors there. There are things that I don't agree. And I think there are things that's missing because it was not a problem in the 1600s. So it's good, this freedom that we have to write our own statement of faith. Of course, you're not going to invent the will. We go back. That's why if you read our statement of faith, you see how much we're borrowing from other confessions. But there are things that's important for us to, oh, look at what we're dealing with today. That they're not dealing in the past. It's good for our church to be clear about these things. So do you understand where we are as a local church? Why we do what we do? Why we can write our own church policy? Our own constitution. It's not from an outside body telling us what to do. We as a church wrote our church policy. We sent the members, gave the approval. Great. Authorized. That's what we believe. That's what we hold together. That's what we see is going to be a wonderful tool to hold us in unity. Let me give you an example. In my own ministry, and some of you know that, Another church that I pastored, I had a serious dis disagreement about ecclesiology. The church is still in town, and if you go and visit that church, you're going to see how different our ecclesiology is. I had a massive disagreement about ecclesiology. And I told, I told the leadership, I said, I'm resigning, I can no longer lead with you. I trust the Lord, He's in charge. Hopefully the congregation will follow Christ's pattern. And I received a letter from the leadership. And they were proposing a meeting with me. And this meeting was with three other pastors from outside. And here's what the document said. We heartily invite you, referring to me, to come to the table with us and three respected men of God from outside the church for consultation and mediation. And look at that. That would be binding upon us for the sake of one another and the future of brothers and sisters. Some of you with tear in your eyes, said, why? Why don't you accept that? Why don't you go to the meeting? And I understand the desire, but they would be going against my conviction of the autonomy of the local church. As soon as I say yes, I'm going against my conviction that the local church is empowered by the Holy Spirit and wise enough to make the right decision. 
And that's why I refused and said no. And some of you got upset and sad. And I understand, but I hope that you understand now why I didn't meet with them. I cannot let three other men having a binding decision upon a body where I belong. For me, that's unbiblical. I believed then that the church, empowered by, empowered by the Spirit, nurtured by the Word of God, would be able to make the right decision for the glory of God. And the vast majority of the members did that. But we talk about independence of the church but, and the autonomy, but we cannot despise the fact that there are associations. The autonomous or independent principle of the church has never meant local church isolation. Baptists from the earliest days of their history have evidenced an association, association of impulse. And that's important. Even though we believe that each local church is autonomous, self-governing, we believe it's biblical and it's good to have an association of churches where we have very similar doctrinal statements. We see that in the Bible. So, for example, there are association of churches, churches helping one another. So, for example, the church in St. Crea is sending Phoebe to bring a letter to the church in Rome. That's an association of churches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read about a partnership of the churches in Macedonia to help other churches. Throughout the book of Acts, we see churches helping one another. And the greatest example is Acts chapter 11. You go there and you see that the church of Jerusalem sends Barnabas to the church of Antioch. And then later the, ch the church in Antioch sends support to the church in Jerusalem. It's an association of churches. So we strongly believe that there is a place for association, convention, network of churches. We are, we as a church, we are part of one. The Northwest Church Network. Wonderful. I was there last week. Wonderful time. Brought Joseph with me to see how it is. Be able to talk. Be able to listen. Be able to ask for advice. Be able to find out that there might be a church plant near us. And that our church can be part in supporting, partnership. Helping in the establishment of an embassy of light in this dark place. So... We support that. We think it's good. But no outside government, person, or group of churches have final and binding authority over us. So Haken, he writes, Churches can and should cooperate with like-minded congregations so they can do more together than any one church can do alone. But this is not the only reason individual congregations should cooperate with, other, with one another. Local churches do not exist in isolation. In most places, they are part of the wider body of Christ in a country, town, or city. Churches need one another, especially when they are of like faith and practice. He says, we sharpen one another theologically. It's so true. We come alongside one another when hurting churches have needs that can be met by sister congregations. We need to be humble enough, enough to ask for help. Selfless enough to serve sister churches and biblical enough to heed the sound counsel of sister churches who lovingly point out errors and faults in our theology or methodology. Historically, most Baptists have agreed that autonomy must be balanced with accountability. Now let me give you another example. This past few weeks, you heard about the Sounder Baptist Convention and the problem with what? Churches ordaining women. So do you see that the SBC has no power to go to those churches, for example, Saddleback Church. The SBC has no power to go there and change their statement of faith and remove the female pastors. No, because we're Baptists. We don't believe that. What we can do is to say, you're not in agreement with our polity, with our policy. Therefore, you can no longer be part of this association. We are not going to change your church. We have no power to go and, and, and move people and remove people. But we are telling you that you cannot be part of our association because you are breaking the rules. So, and that's important. 
the same if it was the opposite. Let's suppose the, the SBC was coming up with a false teaching. And the churches have the liberty to say, no, thank you. And that's, there was some of that happening, and that's why you have different Reformed Baptist associations growing. So I hope that helps you to see how the government of the local church works, and especially in our local church. So we, we strongly endorse and support church associations. Each local church has all that is needed for worship, but local churches need one another. You see, think about the, the local church. Each local church is a beautiful, a beautiful manifestation of the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of, of God is much larger than just one local church. You see, people come here and they see the kingdom of God here. But the kingdom of God is much bigger than this church. The kingdom of God is much bigger than MacArthur's church, than any other church. And that's why it's beautiful when you have cooperation of churches. We reflect more how vast, how glorious the kingdom of God is. It provides the independence and at the same time accountability. So, brothers and sisters, church government is not a topic that make people leap of joy, right? You don't see people excited when they hear about church government. Most churches do not even teach about church government, church polity. I believe it's important. In case in God's providence you move out of this place and you need to find a different church, you will be informed of how important it is. And of course, it's going to vary where you are. If you are in China, if you are in, in an isolated place, you do what you can. <laughs> you get what you can get it. But when you are in a place where you have the freedom to choose churches, be sure what you believe and know how that will affect your life in that local church. Some Christians think it's noble and godly to stay away from such topics, right? Church government is kind of worldly, carnal. Here we are talking about government. Jesus is king. He's king. That implies government. And he's lo he loves his church so much that he doesn't leave us to just do whatever we want. He's the king, and as the perfect king, he establishes the rules. He teaches his people how they are to be governed. And the headship and kingship of Jesus is truly manifest in each local church when all the members are fully, completely in submission to us. And his word. His word. We may be self-governing and independent, but we are never, never independent of the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word and His Holy Spirit. So as we walk through the subject of church government, what it means for this church to be a pastor, elder-led congregation, as we reflect on what, he, what we want for this church, as we seek the well-being, the growth, the health of this church, let us be reminded that our wills and desires must be always in full submission to Christ's word. Whether we are dealing with membership, new members coming, leadership, appointing leaders, church discipline, church budget, each one of us must be under the captivity and submission to the spirit and the word of God. Selfish ambition, carnal desires, looking for your own interest have nothing to do with the kingship, headship, and leadership of Jesus Christ. And when pastors and members, leadership and congregation, submit to the headship of Christ, to the word of Christ, and submit to one another, then and only then, God's blessing is upon that congregation. Amen? So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you that you are the king. <coughs> you are the perfect king. The perfect head of your church. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to trust your goodness, your wisdom. And deliver us from ourselves. 
be glorified in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.